This is where the presence of your salesperson, they need to be able to capture the attention of the person on the other end of the line um, to understand the challenges they have and how they can help them remove the pain from their day-to-day -day job, right? Hi, everyone. You're listening to Scaling DevTools. I'm joined today by Vivian Dufour, who is the founder and CEO of Materian, a company that specializes in open source dependency management. Vivian, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Jack, for having me. Uh, I'm not a sole founder, so just want to clarify, co-founder. Uh, but yeah, I'm half of the, the founding company. Uh, my co-founder, Bruno Bosla, is a CTO and inventor. But yeah, really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to dig into kind of like enterprise sales, how you hire salespeople and all the stuff that you've learned along the way. Um, but first, could you tell us a bit about the origin story of Materian and a bit more about what you do? Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, so I'm product developer, product manager by trade, and um, been working product development for most of my career. And I met my co-founder at an education firm, and our remit was to take a software app viral in um, in schools across across Europe and the world, eventually. And uh, I said, wow, well, it's going to be in the classrooms and teachers and students. That's, that's a pretty, you know, it can be a pretty tense situation if there's like a cyber attack or somebody takes over the session in the app. So I said, could we do a, you know, check on this, the security of the application? And the immediate response from management was, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. Just go viral first and we'll figure out security later. And I said, well, the reputational risk is really too high because of it. You figure out later it's kind of too late. So I did ask my CTO on the team, which is Bruno at the time, uh, to do they say a quick and dirty check. And I said, yeah, you know, take half a day or a day what you need so you get that summary. And then in less than an hour, he came back to me and said, oh, go check your, your account. And he had actually found a backdoor to open source vulnerability and basically compromised my account and you know, had the messages like, ha ha, you've been hacked, moved around some image content that I had, um, I had, you know, curated in my, in my account. And it just showed me how, how easy it is to do. And I knew there were these cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, SQL injection, but I, I didn't realize that, okay, if you know what the fact is, then it is really that easy. It's just minutes. Uh, so that opened my eyes and when the opportunity came up to you know, help them out with the business, then yeah, I jumped on it. So now we're like you know, several years later and we have, we have a successful business at Traction and we're almost self-sustainable. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And, and kind of what, what made you go from like, uh, okay, this is kind of a problem to like, I want to, you know, dedicate all my time and energy to solving that. Well, I think I was quite, frustrated that the industry was starting to have so many hacks and cyber breaches announced on on the news and so many people were affected. Uh, personally, I was affected in the Equifax breach. Uh, that was back in 2017. Uh, that was due to an open source vulnerability in the Apache Struts module uh, that was not patched, even though there was a patch available that could be applied. And unfortunately, I was one of those users who got this mysterious letter in the posts from Equifax saying that my, my data was compromised. So it, it led me to a lot of doubt in uh, the trust of all these large corporations that are holding our data. Uh, and then in the news, many companies, you know, McAfee, LinkedIn, even Yahoo. So I said, this is, this is my good. Like we, we built a great service in terms of putting information online, uh, making it convenient to transact. And we, you know, we really changed the industry to, to have people try new ways of doing things to be more productive, but at a, at a cost of risk that I think now it's become too high. Uh, so when this opportunity came up, I felt, I felt quite like mission oriented and it was something that I could really get behind and use my skills to contribute to, um, to the solution rather than just sit as an innocent bystander. Yeah, that's it, it's definitely a real big mission um, c compared to a lot of things, right? That's very important. Um, 
And do you find that most of the companies you're working with are doing anything around this? Or are you kind of differentiating yourself against like um, alternatives? Oh, it's an established market. So there are many incumbents uh, that have been around, like legacy players, like Black Dot, Veracode, um, come to mind. And more recently, the more recent companies, of course, is the Unicorn Sneak, uh, GitHub, GitLab also have a flavor of uh, software dependency management that they include in their DevOps um, suite of tools for developers. So there's, you know, it's not a small market, um, but we differentiate because we provide a comprehensive risk visibility uh, specifically on open source to NMFs. Uh, we also have very good uh, automation. It's very smart and intelligent. We sense that we um, remove duplicates. We uh, minimize the amount of noise so that developers are not overwhelmed with false positives. So these are definitely verified open source vulnerabilities that have been guided in the fields. Uh, of course, developers themselves have to check uh, if, if it is applicable to their own application, depending on how the logic of their application is, is used. Because many of these dependencies, um, I think you're familiar with, is that they have, um, they're all nested. So they uh, they include other dependent open source components. So therefore you have to also analyze the, the transfer of dependencies. We make it very easy to use. So developers don't have to have um, extensive security knowledge. They just need to uh, be familiar with you know, updating packages and applying uh, patches to your code. And I think the trickier part for developers is they have, often have to do a lot of heavy lifting and integrating tools uh, within their work environment, right? It's uh, how does it work with the code management system? How does it work with the, the CI CD pipeline? And how does it sit in with our other test scripts? Um, how we basically do DevOps internally. Um, so those are the few areas that I would say in terms of usability and our richness of information and precision that we differ from our competitors. But above all, our customers love our amazing customer support uh, because we have engineers working on it who are very familiar with the product, uh, very familiar with the problem space, and also understand the the pains and you know the joys of actually solving those pains for for the developers. Yeah, and but how how do you kind of get in front of them and you know share that with them? So yeah, I think networking skills is really important. Going out to meet uh, customers where they might be. So in the beginning. For us, uh, we went through cyber accelerator program called Cylon. Uh, it was very specialized. So we met a lot of CISOs and CTOs, uh, also other mentors, and we, we just leveraged the pitch opportunities. They set up a lot of pitching events. Uh, and then we find usually many of these accelerator programs also have a, month, um, a final showcase or a demo day, and they try to fill up the audience with a lot of perspective investors as well as uh, customers. So it was through these kind of intros that I would just ask, you know, they would be interested in exploring our product to improve their security or knowing that, of course, they have a product in place looking at, at this particular area. Um, what I just suggested is why don't, why don't you try a side-by-side -side test so that you can get some extra assurance an independent evaluator. And then if it if it works, then you can consider that if you want to replace your existing solution. Alternatively, um, it's, you know, the way for them is more assurance that they know that product that they have in place is good. Uh, and then for us as the, the vendor, we get customer feedback, right? If it's not good enough, then what do we need to improve so that we can be, um, we can take that product market fit. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting approach. I've not seen people try that or, or, or like talk about doing that before. Um, not necessarily like bring us in, just let us like let's test. Like. Yeah. So, but we had to we had to make our product very easy to test. So, huh. I think with enterprise software, that's another that's another key selling point for us is the integration is very easy. So. Because we're just basically a thin client, a script um, that can be inserted into the, the continuous integration pipeline, it was easy to convince 
of CrossFit customers that it would be relatively easy to test as long as they could identify somebody in the organization who would have that capability to do that. So we said, we just need a developer for, you know, half an hour, an hour of their time. So half an hour we demo, and then the rest of the hour they can play with the tool and, you, and do must feedback. Interesting. And I guess they don't like, like there's no, you don't know, make you like check loads of compliance boxes before they'll do that or anything. Uh, it will depend from organization to organization. So uh, we're fine with, you know, doing that demo on test projects that we have. If they want to test it on their own premise, they can either set up you know, a virtual machine that has the environment that they like, uh, or they just decide that, you know, they have a little sandbox on a particular developer's machine. And then mm. there's some, yeah, there are some enterprises that would say, oh, before we even do any pilot, you have to go through uh, lender assessment. Yeah, because do they get very protective over like, because I guess you have to have access to their code base. Some of them are protective over that, like make you sign, sign your uh, life We away definitely or... sign NDAs and then we assure that, you know, they can, they can check the clients. So we don't, we don't force them to, to run it on their premise, but if they want to run on their premise, they have to tell us what they need in terms, you know, if, if they want us to, to fulfill certain vendor assessment criteria, then we get asked what they are and we evaluate that's, that's what it, in terms of time and expense, because, you know, at the end, in the beginning, we really wanted to, to close as many deals as quickly as possible and make sure we were spending the right amount of time to assess if they were really interested in the tool. So that's our, one, we had to make it very easy to use. So that's why um, it works very easily with GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, you know, kind of vanilla installation. Uh, for Azure DevOps, it's a bit more complicated. It will, it will, sometimes it's very easy. We have managed to, to do that in, in yeah, 30 minute demo call with their, you know, the lead tech or, or DevOps person. But sometimes it's more complicated simply because the way it's set up by the, the customer how they use it, it is, it's more complicated. Like it's not straightforward. So then we need to sit with them. Um, or my, I need to have, we need to sit with them and work through that. But overall, the feedback is in, it's extremely easy to use. So we've even, I mean, it's very rare that I see a developer smile. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> I've seen developer or uh, the DevOps folks smiles and oh, it's so easy. I wish our internal tools were the CCT. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And, and when when it goes well, what happens after? Is it kind of like, okay, easy from there? Or is it like you still have a lot of work to do to get a deal? Uh, well, there's always a lot of work to get a deal. <laughs> um, I think it's important to have the right pace and um, try to establish that commitment with the customer up front. So before going into the trial, you know, really understanding, you know, what's their tech stack. So we always ask, you know, what are the tools and languages we want this to work for so that we can be sure that the demo we give is relevant, the setup that we, when we run through the trial uh, is meaningful to them. And we also want to make sure that they understand how to use our reports. Like we don't want them just to install it, run it, and then be it as what they call shopware. Um, we really want to make sure that they understand the reports. So for example, like their code users, um, especially developers, they're not familiar with the output that comes out. It's very hard to understand. It's very hard to act upon. Yeah, maybe you, you have 40 pages in ports. Uh, and then if you're lucky, you, you you resolve the one that makes 20 pages disappear, that kind of experience. But um, we walk them through the report. This is the format. And, you know, here it just shows this is how you can remediate this particular vulnerability. Uh, so it's just a one step on remediation or they can automate that. And yeah, just giving them the tools and the confidence to be able to use it uh, and share the information within the team. So it could be project manager or quality assurance team, could be legal counsel, um, getting a software bill of materials or a list of all the licenses that are being used with ensure that 
uh, the open source licenses are, are being followed uh, per the license terms. So there's a lot to to cover, but you know we have it down as a checklist, and then making sure that they're happy and comfortable with moving to the next step. So we try to make sure that customers would, uh, yeah, so we, we lay out up front, this is what we're going to do in the, in the trial, and you want to make sure that you're happy with these steps. It works with your code management system. It works with the continuous integration system. You understand the reports and you see value in it and you can discuss with your colleagues um, that everyone understands how to, how to use it. So we get upfront agreement that they are happy with that um, acceptance criteria. And then at the end, we review back and say, okay, this is what we've done. And we can choose this, this, this. If we run into a problem, of course, we note it as a, you know, a bug or an issue to look into on how we can resolve. Sometimes it is a bug on our site. Sometimes it's a configuration or a network issue that we've run into that's actually on the customer side. Uh, so we can just follow up with that and then and continue the next day. We try to we try to close that as quickly as possible within the week so that we can move forward to the next step. And the next step would be, okay, you've seen you've seen the the product we play on your own projects. We download it on uh, open source projects that you can see uh, for the different languages. So usually after they crew the net for one language, they don't really need to see it for another language unless there's a, a unique um case that they, they find that, you know, other competitors don't cover you know, Perl for a particular package type or C++ for a particular package type. And then usually at that point, they would ask for the quotes um, and then we review it and we, we encourage them to decide so if they decide quickly, uh, you know, there's a more advantageous price sometimes. Uh, otherwise, if they commit for a longer period, we'll also give discounting on longer term contracts. Mm. Kind of stepping out of the sales process and more into like kind of the management. Um, I know that you have uh, two two salespeople currently in your team. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, could you talk a bit about what it's like to kind of bring in a salesperson, like how you find them and kind of identify who is potentially a good salesperson? Yeah, so I think best way to find salesperson is to talk to other salespeople. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I see that. Because they know who's good. <laughs> yeah, they know who's good. And they, well, they're in the same flock, right? They're always yeah. talking to each other. Just like if you want to find a good dev, probably you talk to your dev friends. Um, you all know, hang out and you do similar kinds of activities. That's, uh, that's, such, a, that's such a good point. Like, I feel like everyone... If you ask a dev at a company, they know who they would hire themselves. Yeah, you know who your your favorite superstars are. So yeah. for us finding the sales people, it was it was challenging because neither my co-founder nor I had well, any sales experience. Um, so we've come a long way. And yeah, we did try we did try different sales folks and we the way we hired was, well, eventually we found someone who was quite experienced with sales. Um, he, he had built sales team from the ground up. He, you know, he was a sales person from the ground up himself. Um, so self-taught and also, you know, picked up a lot of tools of the trade and learned from the States. So he could help us select. And so he helped. So I drafted a job description. He, you know, he also embellished it and then we got to a final version and we posted it on LinkedIn and the different job boards uh, that, that all these startups use uh, and then I started collecting CVs and I shortlist and said okay I picked the CV said that I think we should the candidates that we should we should interview based on the CVs and uh, and then he said yeah I, I, we'll, we'll see when we have the, the person who said book the first interview I made my little scorecard of, you know, capabilities and criteria that I would look out for in the interview. And I have to say that first interview of meeting, you know, it was a, the first screening was online interview. And the second one, we would meet in person if there was a good fit on the, the chat. And even just the first online um, 
meeting was would tell a lot and even the then the follow-up uh, phone calls so in my experience hiring for other roles the cvs were like a product manager or a product engineering or project management roles these professions if you call the candidate they call you back or they email um and then what you see on the the cv is you know it's most of the time it's mostly there you know maybe there are always some candidates that that don't that aren't as reflective about the cv but in the case of this interviewing these um sales development reps many of the cvs were like oh wow that's so great and then when we get on the call it's like oh it's such a different impression um and i think it's because of the proliferation of digital cvs online with the search engines uh so it's very easy to to copy paste and create these excellent cvs so to to weed them out you yes you have to meet them at least online and then in person do you think there's any attributes that you really look for that you think are extremely important in salespeople? Oh, yeah. So definitely, I feel like there needs to be a certain kind of uh, yeah, professionalism in presenting your your company, your brand. That would be like the first face that that the customer would encounter, the first face or even the first voice. Because often, in our case, we were using uh, outbound calls to to find customers. Uh, so we have, you know, that list and then uh, a sales rep will actually call. And it, and, and it works. Yeah. Because I feel like people always say that in developer tools that you can't cold call people, but... I, it's worked for us. Yeah, I, I believe that. I think you can cold call for anything. I get cold called all the time for so many things now. Yeah. How many cold calls, like, does... Is, sorry, to diverse it, but that's actually quite interesting. Like, how... Do you have any tips on some like if someone's gonna who like they cold call like the kind of um decision maker, I guess, more like senior people? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we call CTOs, CISOs. I just think like I, I hear it all the time that it just people just say it doesn't work. And it obviously does work. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, they just point blank say it doesn't work. People say call people say cold emailing doesn't work. And so they definitely say cold calls don't work in developer tool space. But I guess you're not calling developers usually. It's more um, like there's some developer. We yeah we we have called developers before as well. I think it works because you seize the moment, and this mm. is where the presence of your salesperson they need to be able to capture the attention of the person on the other end of the line in mm. the way that is not going to basically rub them the wrong way. Yeah. And I think given that, you know, a lot of time is spent online, um, in front of the computer, like when you're on the computer, you're probably working on a document, you're in a meeting. Um, so calling someone is, if they pick up the phone, it means they're open to an interruption. Uh, so, when you're in focus mode and work, and maybe you're less likely to, you know, mm. like with email, maybe now we get so many emails, people are scanning their emails, and then, um, you know, it's not allowed them to just skip it. Yeah. So that's that's why, like, an email campaign and Zubo, you have to write um, engaging copy to grab the attention in the subject line, right? They, they say how many yeah. characters, don't be too verbose, and then you have to use the light words to get people's attention so it applies also in in cold calling mm. uh, so just back to the traits of the salesperson i would say uh yeah how they present themselves so even audio wise um the voice has to be clear you know if somebody mumbles they're not going to understand what they say uh, the volume has to be good uh, probably has to be interesting interesting voice to listen to uh and you know, there's a, that's a subjective call. Uh, so for some people, you know, for some people, maybe they prefer my voice over your voice and vice versa. So that's that's another reason why it's good to have a yeah. diverse team, <laughs> right? You, so, so below. <laughs> right? Like maybe one, one salesperson didn't manage to catch that customer and then assign it to somebody else. And they go, oh, well, yeah. I, I got that one. 
I like this person. <laughs> yeah. So it's true. Know, so true. Yeah. We're all different. And yeah. Uh, but there, there definitely are some common traits, which is, yeah, you have to be clear. You have to be well represented, uh, present yourself well. Sorry. Uh, and then I, I think you have, I think good salespeople have a genuine desire to help the customer, mm. to help the person on the other line, um, to understand the challenges they have and how they can help them remove the pain from their day-to-day -day job, right? So just give you an example. Um, I spoke to uh, a CISO and head of engineer, head of software engineer, yeah, software EA, um, and they... They said, oh, well, I'm, I mean, so many meetings all the time. And I said, well, what, what kind of meetings? So like security review meetings, you know, looking at pen test results and then deciding what we do next and how do we de-risk? I said, okay, well, I mean, we're not in pen testing, but we identify risks that your developers could catch early on as they're developing the code. So it will reduce the amount of meetings that you would need because we have fewer issues popping up further downstream. Mm. So that's part of the whole shift left movement that all the developers who are aware of security know about. Um, so we, we leveraged that value that we could bring. And then we also, you were already saying that, you know, we're really excellent in what we do. We have excellent coverage. We have excellent, um, you know, deliver excellence in terms of ease of use. So that the developers feel the least friction possible, um, and then yeah, that was proven when when they had to do the integration test. And we just we said here are the instructions. Um, we we did do a demo on a you know in a call half hour and we and said okay here, now you go try it on your own, and then we'll have a meeting and you said okay we not we're busy this week we'll have a meeting in two weeks, um, and then in that call it was like 10 minutes they said yeah we verified actually we use all three methods and all three works smoothly and then we had nothing else to discuss on the call so we said okay can you please let your um you know the manager could um sorry there's a bird on the roof <laughs> there's a little skylight so it made some noise but the um yeah so they they uh their project manager another project the sponsor was not able to attend the meeting. So I said, well, please let your sponsor know that everything is, you know, passed with flying colors, green light all the way so that we can progress to, um, to complete the purchase. And, and that would, yeah, very smoothly. Amazing. Hmm. Amazing. It happens. Yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. And that was, I guess, largely because you were trying to help be helpful. Yeah. Um, and then when you actually hire a salesperson, and you bring them in to the team. And I guess they may or may not know about what you do, much about what you do. Um, how, how do you get them like up and running really fast and, you know, mm -hmm. doing a great job? Uh, well, so by now we have a sales playbook, uh, you know, kind of a, a script and then different branches. And then we, so we have our model but then we ask each salesperson to you know, study it and then adapt it to their own taste, their own language, their own understanding of the product and how they would want to pitch it. Uh, so usually that's the first week. And then mm -hmm. they also spend time with uh, a tech team. So definitely in their own days is with Bruno, since he always been also doubling up on pre-sales and then mm -hmm. Um, they can ask all the questions like always, you know, sometimes in cybersecurity, there's so many different products, right? So mm -hmm. they might say, oh, well, this tool does vulnerability management. How, how are we different from, mm -hmm. you know, like a Tenable or um, Coveri or some of these other tools that also do vulnerability scanning, but they cover a different area. Um, so I think that's very important for salesperson to validate their understanding and talk yeah. directly to the tech team but when you're starting from scratch i think that's that's the hardest one so the best is if founders have you know like the first version hmm. of how how they pitch 
how do you do the greeting? How do you introduce the product? How do yeah. you get commitment for the first meeting? Yeah, that's kind, it feels like that's kind of the founder's job. The, it's like one of the most important things, I guess, is to just figure that out. Like what resonates? Yeah, it'd be hard to outs, kind of outsource that to like oh, yeah, you can't outsource someone coming in. You know? No, because only you know the product. And then you hear directly what the customers say they don't understand. They, they, if they appeal to them, then you have to go back and edit your your pitch or your script. You know, I say script, but you can't read it like a script. Yeah. You can follow <laughs> one minute of your time. And... Uh, yeah. Um, and do you think that salespeople need to be able to code or to understand, like to have worked as developers oh, in, no, in your space? they don't need to, no. I don't think they need to. If they if they have done that, of course, then either you have more material to connect with the the customer maybe later down in you know, as you develop the discussions and the relationship, you can reference things that you have in common, but you don't need to you don't need to have programs and uh remediated vulnerabilities. You just have to yeah. understand the problem and the pain. And understand, yeah, you know, what the customer wants is all. Like, do they have do they have this problem or pain? Um, when when would they like it resolved by? Like, do they have budget to actually spend money on a tool to resolve it? Like, do they care? Yeah, that's uh, that makes sense. Yeah, Vivian, thanks so much for joining. Um, where can people learn more about you and about Materian? Uh yeah, so. Definitely check us out, uh, materian.io. Uh, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is Vivian at materian.io. And you know, we love to help you if you have security challenges in your open source dependencies and want to have that level of excellence that just doesn't exist uh, in the market with the, the de facto tools that you get for free and even some of the paid tools. So we're loved by both uh, startups and enterprises. So if you'd like to raise that level of excellence for your own projects uh, in the organizations that you work in, then definitely check us out. Um, for open source projects, we offer a free uh, free plan because we are helping the open source community. For, of course, closed source projects, we are a commercial tool and we do have paid plans. Uh, you have one free project allowed for a free scan and analysis, and we can have a quick chat on what other value we can bring to to you and and your organization so we'd love to help and just yeah reach out amazing well thank you vivian and thanks everyone for listening thank you jack